Good evening. I'd like to call this meeting September 20th, 2021 to order. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United, United States. States of America. Please stand for the flag salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Adequate notice of this meeting was advertised on the district website on January 14th, 2021, re-advertised on the district website on September 17th, 2021, sent to the Asbury Park Press on September 17th, 2021, and posted in the Forked River Post Office and the Lenoka Harbor Post Office, and by filing a copy of the notice with the Lacey Township Clerk, as required by the Open Public Meeting Act. Mr. DeGeorge, can we have a roll call for attendance, please? Mrs. Claus. Here. Mr. Scanlon. Here. Mr. Peters. Present. Mrs. DeSensa. Here. Mrs. Downing. Here. Mr. Polino. Present. Mrs. McAvoy. I'm here. Thank you, Mr. DeGeorge. At this time, we would virtually like to welcome our new SGA Executive Board President, Alexis Frazee, and our new Class President of the Senior Class, Mason Heck. They have some words for us. Please listen up. Good evening. I'm Alexis Frazee, the Student Government Association Executive Board President. We are currently planning the new student breakfast for October. We will invite all of our current SGA officers and new students to breakfast. Our goal is to welcome our new students into the Lion Pride by meeting some friendly faces and giving them information on our current clubs, activities, and sports. The next SGA meeting is Monday, October 4th at 1.45 p.m. We are also working on planning our homecoming dance that is tentatively set for October 23rd. Hello, I'm Mason Heck, the senior class president, and each month the SGA gets to highlight a student whose high achievements go unnoticed. This student is involved in many clubs and activities within the school. She can be found in the bowling alley in the winter and on the lacrosse fields in the spring and dance all year outside of school. She is also a member of SGA, Interact, and NHS and is always involved and ready to get help whenever it's needed. Not only does the student go above and beyond on the field and in her extracurriculars, but also in the classroom. She takes rigorous classes and is always up for a challenge. This student is extremely hardworking and always gives her best effort when it comes to projects, tests, etc. She is always kind and willing to help others whenever it is in the classroom or outside the classroom. For these reasons, SGA has chosen Kaylin Dean as September's Unsung Hero. Congratulations, Kaylin, on winning the Unsung Hero Award for September. You really deserve it. You're a great person. Thank you. Thank you, Alexis and Mason. We're looking forward to seeing you in person. At this time, I'd like to have the report of the superintendent. Dr. Clark, please. Thank you, Board President McAvoy. Welcome uh, once again to the September board meeting. Um, and I would also like to extend a welcome to our student representatives, Alexis and Mason. Um, like Mr. Uh, Mrs. McAvoy just said, uh, we hope to see them uh, in person next month or the month after. Uh, we're going to have to wait and see where uh, that takes us. Uh, and thank you uh, to the both of you for your informative reports. And uh, congratulations to uh, Kaylin Dean uh, for being, uh, being named the Matthew Blum Unsung Hero. Uh, we love that award. I, I know um, Mrs. Downing always talks about the Unsung Hero uh, recognition, and it is uh, also one of my favorites. Okay, so uh, I'm going to officially welcome our students and staff back to school. And I wanna thank our staff, students and parents for a very smooth opening. We did have a few hiccups with transportation uh, first few days of school, perhaps the first week, but these were quickly resolved and we were back on schedule toward the end of the week. And for that, I have to recognize and thank our transportation coordinator, Maria Valiente and all of our bus drivers for doing an amazing job 
um, Mr. Zielinski and I were out there for a couple of days of school and um, our bus fleet is incredible. And I think people just really don't realize what it takes to get our students safely to and from school, but that does not happen um, by itself. Mr. Zielinski, Ms., uh, Mr. DeGeorge and I welcomed our district staff back on the first day of staff orientation. Uh, we visited each of the schools on the first day of school and it was truly amazing and refreshing to see our students and staff back. While we aren't completely back to normal yet for obvious reasons, we are certainly well on our way. So let's talk about masks. Um, last week, I sent out a message that due to improved weather conditions, um, effective immediately, which was last week and moving forward, masks are required by all students and staff in all indoor areas of our school buildings and on all school buses. And I know that there are many, many personal feelings about this issue. And I also know that emotions are running very high. But I am imploring our school community to work together until the mask mandate is lifted. Um, we've been talking about the fact that uh, we wanted to get back to normal. And like I said, we thought that uh, we were going to be back to normal without the masks. Um, and then in early August, the governor um, made that announcement. So we still have uh, the potential for some warm days ahead. Uh, this past weekend was an indication of that. It was a fantastic weekend. We know that wearing a mask all day can be challenging and our teachers and staff are working very, very hard to lessen the impact by providing students with frequent, ma frequent mask breaks um, throughout the day, but in a safe way. And we have to be cognizant of that. My final comment about all of this is that while there are many opinions about wearing masks, one thing we know for certain is this, wearing a mask and maintaining social distance lessens the need for students and staff to be identified as a close contact and missing up to 14 days of school for quarantining. The matrix that we follow to determine whether quarantine happens or has to happen is outlined in the New Jersey Department of Health's exclusion criteria, which is posted on our website. So if you go on our website and you click the COVID-19 information, it takes you to the COVID-19 information landing page. And that document that I just referenced is listed on the left-hand side of the menu. It's the last document listed. The last time it was updated was on August 31st. Uh, what I am gonna do is is I am going to ask our assistant superintendent, Mr. Zielinski, to briefly provide us with an overview of the current quarantining rules, because I also recognize that that's very confusing as well. It's different than when we ended school um, in June, and that is due to um, vaccination status and masks. So Mr. Zielinski, can you uh, delve into that, please? So yes, thank you very much. And the most important thing is that um, those rules are posted on the website. Uh, you can Google K-12 health recommendations for New Jersey schools and it will come up right away. Um, and there is a colored chart uh, about halfway through the document that really spells out how quarantine and, and what we consider uh, isolation works uh, whenever we are dealing with a COVID-19 case. Um, and the other note that's most important about quarantines when we talk about quarantining students in school is that we are trying to limit as best we can any school to school transmission of COVID-19. And that's why um, I like to call it, we, we have very robust contact tracing um, and we follow the quarantine rules as close as we possibly can um, whenever we are dealing with um, a, a case of COVID-19 that is brought to our attention, um, you know, typically by parents who call us and say that, you know, their child has been diagnosed or their family member has been diagnosed with uh, COVID-19. Um, you'll notice if you do go look at the chart uh, without really diving into all the details of it is that we're split up into different colors. Uh, we are currently in the high uh, uh, transmission risk category. We've been there for several weeks now um, in our region, which includes Monmouth and Ocean County. Um, and that requires that when a student or anybody is in close contact with somebody with COVID-19 and close contact is defined as six under six feet for more than 15 minutes which typically would be a classroom setting or at lunch uh you would have to quarantine for 14 days to make sure um that you do not develop COVID 19. 
Um, it's interesting to note is that if you get COVID-19, you only have to isolate for 10 days. So there are some differences as you go through the chart. If you, um, hopefully you don't have to deal with it, but if you do have to deal with it, um, we will always refer you to the chart and you can go look at that chart uh, as we move along um, whenever we have a problem. Um, you know, contact tracing was extremely difficult uh, over the past two weeks. Um, so the other piece of the puzzle that was introduced to us this year, it's not what we dealt with last year, is the masking rules. When students wear their masks and wear them properly, um, unless the student has COVID-19, nobody has to quarantine uh, if they're in the regular classroom setting if they're wearing their masks. Um, that will ultimately cut down the number of quarantines that we have within our schools. Um, because uh, it makes contact tracing that much easier because typically in the classroom setting, everybody's wearing their masks. Um, we do have to look at the lunches. That's very important for us to do because we have to make sure um, of lunches because they're removing their masks at lunches. And of course, uh, during after school activities, uh, we have to watch that very closely as well. Um, if you are vaccinated, uh, you do not have to quarantine whether you're wearing a mask or not. Um, so uh, if you are asymptomatic, which means you have no symptoms and you are fully vaccinated, which means it is two weeks past your second shot. Uh, there is no need to quarantine at this time. And we just ask that parents um, uh, provide us with that uh, when, uh, if, if unfortunately they're faced with a quarantine or they're faced with a close contact. Um, our nurses are very good in some buildings, especially the high school. You may not deal with the nurse only because of the volume uh, during certain times of the week. Uh, that we're dealing with as far as contact tracing and quarantines. Uh, but um, typically just if, you're, if your student is vaccinated, uh, that information should only go to our nurses. It should never go to an assistant principal or anybody else. You can certainly share them with the information, but when you have the actual information, when they ask you for it, please only share that with school nurses uh, because they're confidential. Um, did I hit all the points there, Dr. Clark? You did. And um, Mr. Zielinski and I will make sure that um, our FAQ document that is posted on our website uh, is updated uh, to reflect and clarify um, the information as it relates to quarantining. So thank you. Yes. And I'd also just, if I could just one more thing, if I could just interrupt, um, we're only as good as the information that we get when we contact trace. So certainly parents, it's an interactive process. Uh, we um, uh, continue to talk through the isolation or quarantine period to make sure that we haven't made a mistake and to make sure uh, that everybody who um, needs to be quarantined is quarantined. Because like I said, stated at the beginning, the goal is no school to school transmission uh, because that um, is where uh, we can get into trouble. So thank you, I'm sorry. No, that's okay. And uh, thank you uh, for that explanation. Um, and again, uh, we will update our um, document um, to reflect that information. And then the last thing I wanted you to cover, uh, Mr. Zielinski, is what happens um, in terms of instruction when a student is quarantined? Because we know that the virtual option uh, was removed uh, for the beginning of the school year. So can you touch upon that a little bit? So so the governor um, and, and the, the state DOE um, does not provide for virtual instruction this year, but they want us to provide, they have, of course we have to provide the instruction for quarantine and isolated individuals. Um, it is going to be on a very individualistic approach. Um, I'll say up front, I want the parents to please contact us and notify us if they feel like um, it's not happening. Uh, from grade 7 to 12, we'll be live streaming the classes for the most part, uh, where students, because they have one-to-one, -one, we have a one-to-one -one program there where the students bring home their Chromebooks, um, where the teachers will open a private window with those students, and then they can listen to the entire class period in most cases unless they're doing individual work. And all the assignments will be placed in, placed in Google Classroom and in Canvas in the cases of the high school. The lower grades, all the lessons should be posted into the Google, into the Google Classroom document. The middle, excuse me, the Mill Pond School is providing uh, more one-to-one -one help because they have that activity period, which, la which is in the afternoon, where students can log in individually with their teachers and touch base with them. And then at the elementary level, really based on the individual needs, because of course they're elementary students with individual needs. Uh, they're working closely with their classroom teachers uh, to make sure that that instruction goes on. And of course we know that instruction when elementary students are home is quite difficult, uh, but they're gonna, you know, our teachers are, are, are very attentive to it. And um, 
If you have any trouble, please reach out to your principals. Um, but it's, it's as best we can uh, to provide that commensurate instruction uh, while the students are quarantined or isolated, because those are the two opportunities where we um, are going to provide the education when they're at home. Because virtual does not exist as it did last year. It's a little bit different this year. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, um, we're going to transition. I'm really excited to bring back our uh, seniors of the month. Uh, of course, we haven't had uh, any presentations throughout the summer. So uh, the recognition tonight uh, are our very first seniors. And um, Mr. Lytle, I believe we are ready to uh, roll those videos. Good evening, I'm Greg Brandis, principal of Lacey Township High School. One of the best things about being principal of Lacey is being able to celebrate student achievement. I'd like to thank the Board of Education for giving me the opportunity to celebrate the Seniors of the Month at each board meeting. I'd like to start with September's Senior of the Month. Congratulations to Alexis Frazee. Congratulations, and at this time, we'll watch a brief video of her accomplishments. I'm Alexis Frazee, and I'm proud to be September Senior of the Month for Lacey Township High School. Um, for my two LTHS teachers, I would like Mr. Sotero and Mr. Fritz. Congratulations, Alexis, on winning Senior of the Month. I'm unbelievably proud. Congratulations, Lex, on being September's Senior of the Month. Well-deserved. I'm the Student Government Association Executive Board President. I'm the president of FBLA and DECA, and I play first singles for the varsity tennis team at LTHS. Lex is a kind, thoughtful young lady who balances an extraordinary academic load with an even more extraordinary extracurricular load. Whenever I think about you, I think about the things that set you apart from your other peers. Uh, Lex truly cares that everybody in her class enjoys the high school experience and is part of the Lacey family. You're hardworking, dedicated, goal-oriented, and all these skills have only honed over the last four years. I would have to say my favorite memory from LTHS is the battle of the classes and all the preparations that involved leading up to it. It was just such a fun time and it really brought out the school spirit at LTHS. Lex can be seen just about anywhere outside of the school, making sure everybody is involved and doing their absolute best. Thinking about funny memories, it's really too difficult to think about just one. We've had so many over the last four years. We've been through a lot. I'd like to also congratulate Lex on still having the same iPhone she had at the end of the year last year. She is notorious for, we'll call it, mishandling her iPhone. So four months in a row, I think is a record. So great job on that as well, Lex. Couldn't be prouder. In my free time after school, I enjoy boating during the summer and during the winter months, I play indoor tennis. Whenever you work on a physical object, you have about 10 times more questions than everybody else. I do truly appreciate that though, because it means that you are dedicated towards the overall goal. After high school, I hope to attend Georgetown University in Washington, DC and pursue a major in finance or accounting. And I wish you the best of success and have the best senior year this year. Good luck in all your future endeavors. And again, congratulations on being this month's Senior of the Month. Welcome back. And thank you for allowing me to celebrate the Students of the Month. At this time, I'd like to congratulate Anthony Cooper. Congratulations, Anthony. And at this time, we'll watch a video of his accomplishments as well. I'm Anthony Cooper, and I'm proud to be named September's Senior of the Month for at least Dodge High School. Congratulations, Anthony, on winning Senior of the Month. It is absolutely well-deserved. Outside of LTHS, I mainly socialize with friends, play pickup basketball, and play beach volleyball with my friends. Anthony Cooper, congratulations on earning Senior of the Month for September 2021. Some of my favorite memories spent here at LTHS have been with the volleyball team as I've grew, uh, gained great fr friendships over time with that team. You deserve this honor because you're goal-oriented, hardworking, driven, and you love to problem solve. This has been proven time and time again inside and out of the classroom. Anthony, there are a lot of memories that we shared together, a lot of them funny, a lot of them like, whoa, but the singular memory that I had the honor of sharing with you is being a member of the first volleyball team to win their first division title in 14 years. The hard work that you put in is singular and paramount to the type of student athlete you are. And on behalf of all your players and teammates and coaches and peers, I just wanna say thank you 
and congratulations on not just achieving that moment, but also being able to share it with me and everyone else in the program. After high school, I plan to go on to college and study something within engineering or computer science. Over the years, one thing I really admire is your laid back personality. You don't really let things get to you, or at least you don't show it on the outside. You stay cool and calm, and I think that's why you've been really successful over the years. Anthony, congratulations again on this deserving honor. What a way to start the 2021-2022 school year. Good luck to you. I will see you in the halls at Girls Volleyball Ball Matches as a manager and back in the spring to defend our B-South championship. So congratulations once again, Anthony Cooper, on winning Senior of the Month. Well deserved. We're back again here to celebrate the seniors of the month. At this time, I'd like to congratulate Kira Rhino for being the vocational senior of the month. Congratulations, Kira. And at this time, we'll watch a video of her accomplishments as well. I'm Kira Rhino, and I'm proud to be September senior of the month. I was on the freshman softball team my freshman year, and then sophomore and junior year, I also did softball. Hey, I'm Mr. Leonard, autistic teacher here, as well as the JV softball coach. Wow, Kira Rhino, Ryan Dizzle, Fergalicious, you did it. September's Vocational Senior of the Month. It seems like it was just yesterday, Rhino, that it was my first year coaching. I'm sitting on the bus and I hear a Fergalicious rap going down in the back. I turn around and your contagious laugh just spreads throughout the bus. I will never forget that day. I like to hang out with my family and my friends, play softball. Read. I take the medical skills where I'm training to be a CNA. Kira Rhino, Ryan Dizzle, Fergalicious. Congratulations on receiving September's Vocational Student of the Month. I cannot wait to see what the future holds for you, and I know you're going to be one heck of a nurse. Congratulations again. Okay. Congratulations, Alexis, Anthony, Kiara, and our unsung hero, Kaylin. Uh, we hope to have you uh, to a, a public in-person uh, board meeting so that we can personally hand you your uh, plaques and your certificates. Um, how amazing, September, first seniors of the month and our first unsung hero, so good stuff. All right, uh, we are now going to uh, turn our attention to a presentation that we do um, every year this time of year. And I'd like to turn it over to Mr. DeGeorge to present part one of the public school budget. Thank you, Dr. Clark. Good evening, everyone. So we haven't hardly begun the 2021-22 school year. And here we are speaking about creating the 2022 2023 school year budget. So if it's ever a question of the budget that we have is built around curriculum, which means that uh, Mr. Lytle, it is all about um, the kids. So the first thing, uh, next please, first thing we'll talk about is the calendar. Everything in public education has a calendar, every single thing, and the budget is no exception. So Mr. Light, if you could just put up the first few months, please. Here we are in July, August, September, opening the year. Uh, in August, I distributed all of what we call the data collection tools to all of our 15 budget managers. Right now, we're in the process of developing some goals and objectives, and uh, we'll start collecting those budgets and reviewing them. And then we'll talk about preparing the tentative budget for presentation to the board in February. Uh, next, please. And then in March, the board will adopt that tentative budget. The county office will approve it. And then we'll start talking about preparation of the final budget. And then when we get to July and August, it's the beginning of the next budget year already. We put the link down at the bottom of that screen. At some point, you'll be able to access what's called the DOE, Department of Education budget calendar. It's not ready yet, but when it is, we'll, uh, we'll let you know and you can go ahead and take a look at that. It's uh, about a 25 page document. Next, please. As with anything else in education, understanding budget really begins with basic budget terms. And not to oversimplify the school budget, but it's a plan. It's a plan for the Board of Education 
to uh, appropriate, encumber, and expend uh, the revenue that it will plan to receive in the coming school year. An appropriation really means that the revenue uh, budgeted for a particular purpose. An encumbrance is really locking that money up legally so that it can be spent on a specific item. The expenditure is the payment of that encumbered money. And then revenue, of course, is that those funds that the district expects to receive in that budget year. Next, please. Basically, two types of appropriations. Uh, fix, which means really the board and the district has no discretion or control over that. And examples of a fixed uh, appropriation is the debt that it owes, contractual obligations, and any regulatory requirements put upon the district. Variable, on the other hand, is an appropriation over which the district has at least some control and over which may change from period to period. Some examples wages, increase or decrease based upon the number of employees, benefits the same, supplies increase or decrease in accordance with the number of classrooms, and professional development increases also with the number of staff members we have who need professional development. So how do we create a budget? How complicated is it really? There are basically three steps. The first step is to determine the amount of money the district anticipates receiving in a given school year. The second step is to estimate how much the district needs to spend in a given school year, that same school year. And step three, with any luck, the estimated revenue must equal the estimated appropriations. That is a fact, no more, no less. So let's take a look at the current 2021-2022 school year budget. We'll take a look at revenue. And we say this all the time, and it's just the way our district revenue stream lines up. Local tax levy, by far the greatest source of revenue, as state aid being the second. Combine the two, and that accounts for 94.5% of all of the general operating revenue the district receives. 70.1% of the operating budget is the local tax levy, and 24.4% of the operating budget is state aid. Next, please. So the breakdown, no surprise. If you look at the bottom of this multicolored pie chart, you will see that compensation and benefits account for 82% of the district's appropriation. Next, please. The next couple of slides are the Department of Education mandated categories for expenditures or appropriations, regular programs, which really means any other instruction other than special education. There is special education, bilingual, uh, co-curricular with the clubs, and of course, athletics, tuition for students we send out of district, attendance and health related services for special needs students, and guidance expenses, child study team, and other, including our library. Next, please training of our staff, administration, not only of the central office, but of the buildings account for the most of that. Information technology, uh, operations and maintenance and security where we kind of put all of our capital items, transportation, the cost of transporting our students, the cost of benefits, which we spoke about a little bit ago, and then capital outlay, which are all of the, uh, the money that the district plans to spend on capital projects in our facilities area. And as you can see, if you were to go back a couple of slides, the appropriations exactly matches the uh, general fund revenue. So step number three, revenue must equal appropriations. So next, please. What is the key to it all? It is sustainability. What do I mean by that? The board is obligated to create a budget that uh, is sustainable, that's able to be carried out from year to year to year. And again, and we didn't go into it too much in the uh, revenue slides, but this is another year coming up that we're going to lose another $1.2 million in state aid. So it's gonna be continue to be extremely important that the budget contains nothing uh, that cannot be sustained in future years. 
So as Mr. Lytle started to, uh, to show you, the board has a very important role, understanding how our district operates, how it's governed, uh, the policies uh, that we have, that it creates, and it sees that we administer, that we have sound curriculum and programs. And, and I'm happy to say that in this current budget, and again, anticipating the needs of the future budgets, uh, Dr. Clark, Mr. Zelinsky, and the instructional team has done an excellent job of using our one-time type expenditure of funds to really create and, and put out for our students a very robust curriculum. The board also needs to understand the budget process, and this is really the first step in that process. And, and everybody here is a veteran by now. Every one of our board members understands fully what the budget process is, establish some clear goals, and we talk about that at our finance committee in the next couple of months, which have to be aligned with our mission. Remain informed as what is happening in the development of the budget, throw out periodic updates in, from us uh, and Dr. Clark and uh, other meaningful constructive comments that the board is free to make. And we look forward to hearing and review and approve preliminary and final budgets that we should submit to the county office. Not to oversimplify it again, but that's, that's it. That's the understanding. It's, it's not conceptually difficult to create a budget, uh, but in practice, especially again, and not to beat a dead horse, but we lose uh, five point million, five or five million dollars in state aid in the past and in the coming couple of years to create a budget which is balanced and sound and curriculum centered. It's a pretty good job that this board does in creating budgets. The other part after a budget is created is how is a budget managed from day to day, week to week, month to month. That's what we're going to talk about when we get together on October 21. So I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Clark and the Board of Education for allowing me to present this information. This presentation will be on our district website tomorrow, if it's not there already. And uh, that is all I have, Dr. Clark. Thank you, Mr. DeGeorge. And uh, like Mr. DeGeorge said, it's hard to believe that uh, we're even talking about the budget for next school year, considering we just started the uh, current. but. That is the process and um, we start early and we're always thinking ahead. Um, I'm gonna conclude my comments um, tonight very close to how I started. And, and that is to say once again, that I know there are many, many personal feelings about many issues as uh, they relate to the pandemic, masks, uh, vaccinations. Um, but one thing that I read um, just this morning in an excellent article uh, by a gentleman named Lawrence Feinside, who is the executive director of the New Jersey School Boards Association is this, and I'm gonna quote him. We cannot find common ground without civility and we cannot solve our problems without finding common ground. So I think at this point, um, it's very obvious that we're not all going to agree on uh, the topics as they relate to the pandemic, but. Um, the other, when I read this article, I also thought about this very important concept, and that is that we are in the business of education, and our business in, of education is educating our students, and our students are watching us, and they're learning from us, and I, I have this quote here in my office that reads, children live what they learn, and so we have to be responsible in that regard and be reminded of what it is that we are teaching them. Um, and, and that is that we have to treat each other with respect. We have to respect um, each other's opinions and we have to listen to those who hold opposing um, viewpoints from our own. And, and we have to do that in a civil way. Um, and that is why we're here. Uh, Mr. DeGeorge started his presentation about the school budget. And that is to say that we're here for the kids um, and we are role models for them as well. And then the last uh, couple of comments that I wanna make is it's been quite a while since we've uh, presented the Lacey Minute and we uh, brought that to our board meetings and we're proud of it. And so uh, Mr. Merman and I are going to be meeting next week to talk about uh, reviving the Lacey Minute because it really shows, um, it, it showcases 
um, all of the great things that our students and our, our teachers and our parents are accomplishing here in the Lacey Township School District. And um, I am looking forward to bringing those back. And so um, I will end by saying, uh, Mr. Merman, let's get the uh, email up and running so that our uh, parents and our teachers can start submitting clips so we can start putting um, those videos together again. All right, that concludes my comments, Board President McAvoy. Um, it was an excellent opportunity to uh, present tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you, Mr. Zielinski, Mr. DeGeorge, and Dr. Clark for your presentations. Very informative. And Dr. Clark, we're also going to revive the spotlight on alumni starting next month. So each board member will take a month and we'll spotlight alumni and their successes. So that's, that'll be exciting to look forward to also. At this time, we are going to have public comment. An audience member wishing to make a comment shall raise his or her hand and when called upon or virtually state their name, address, or affiliation and intention to make a statement. Comment shall be addressed to the board president and made on one issue at a time. Comments are limited to five minutes, after which time the presenter will be muted to allow others to speak. Mr. DeGeorge will tell you when your five minutes is up. No audience member will be recognized twice until all who wish to comment have been recognized. So Mr. Merman, at this time, can we have public comment, please? Thank you, Mrs. McAvoy. Anyone who would like to comment at this time is instructed to virtually raise your hand using the Zoom app or dial star nine if you're calling in via telephone. Your Zoom app does need to be updated to at least 5.7.8 to speak. You will be called to unmute your microphone and speak in turn. And at this time, we will recognize Rachel Prenville. You may unmute your microphone, state your name and address, and begin your public comment. Hi, my name is Rachel Prendeville. Can you all hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, good. My name is Rachel Prendeville. I live at 527 Elwood Street in Forkard River. Um, what I wanted to speak tonight about is a problem that I had with this um, Renesca at the Cedar Creek School. I had um, gotten my son's medical notes and the first note, hold on one second, that I wanted to show you is a note that I wrote. I don't know if you could see, I wrote it myself. And it's about the mask mandate. And it says, I, Rachel Prendeville, am parent of, of my son. And I'm writing you, I'm writing to you from that my child receives an exemption from the policy mask mandate, New Jersey Executive Order 251, sections A, B, C, and H. My child has the, ex, the health reasons, and I list them below. <clears throat> and it's my request. And I have this also signed by myself. And I had it signed by a doctor. This wasn't good enough for Ms. Renesca. She had um, placed a phone call to me and she said that they can't accept this note because it could have been forged, which I understand. And she would like it on letterhead from the doctor. I then called the doctor and I got letterhead for all three of my children. And these are, I, I cropped off the top because everybody doesn't need to see this but I did send this in an email to Dr. Clark. Um, all three of my children have letters with medical exemptions. This also was not good for Ms. Renesca. She had placed a phone call to my fiance and said that this isn't um, accepted for the medical exemption. And um, reason being it's coming from a chiropractor's office. The doctor does work out of a chiropractor's office. Um, I'm not gonna list which one, but you guys have this in an email. My point being is I can't, I went to my pediatrician. The pediatrician works for Meridian, um, Hackensack Meridian. They said that they will not write any kind of medical mandate at all. It's coming from their corporate office. Um, they would in fact give me a mask break mandate um, note, which wasn't good enough for me. My little son has never worn a mask and he's not going to start now. The first day of school, 
my son. Now they have my wishes. They know clearly what my wishes are, um, whether they're going to accept this or not through Cedar Creek. Um, I have a signed document from a doctor. I'm just going to say it like that to put it nicely. Um, I then looked up the executive order uh, to the new one is the one right after the mask mandate. And it said that, and I've also put this in an email, that um, any doctor, a nurse practitioner, a nurse, um, even a, um, a pharmacist could even write the letter. And that's coming from Governor Murphy's, um, the newest executive order on the mask mandate. And it's listed and I did write an email and I put that in there. So my question to the board would be, right now, Lacey Township is in direct violation of the executive order because they didn't accept my note. So my question to the board would be, what kind of doctor's note or doctor would you like to see in these medical exemption forms? Um, Mrs. Prenderville, we appreciate your concerns and we are very concerned also. I'm going to ask Mr. Zelensky to call you first thing in the morning to discuss your issues more in depth, if, if that's okay with you. Yes, that, that's okay. Okay, I, and I, um, I rest assured he will call you first thing in the morning and we can get this worked out. Yeah, I know you guys weren't uh, inundated with emails and I yeah, because Dr. Clark always responds to me, whether it's uh, not even the next day, maybe a couple of days later. So I know that the emails yes. are coming through and all that. <laughs> Um, yes, we appreciate it. And um, Mr. Zelinsky will call you first thing in the morning. And um, but we do appreciate your concerns and thank you. we hope we can get it all worked out. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, if there's anybody else who would like to make a public comment, you may raise your hand via the Zoom app at this time. Okay, uh, Jessica DeLuca, please unmute your microphone, state your name and address and begin your public comment. My name is Jessica DeLuca, can you hear me? Yes, Jessica, we can hear you. Okay, great. Um, I first wanna say that I was extremely, extremely disappointed that everybody walked out and decided to postpone the last meeting. Um, I felt that, yes, there were some that were not willing to wear a mask. And as per your um, notice that was on every website, it was that those members or those people would be asked to leave. Um, there was a lot of parents like myself that have been waiting a month to make these comments to you guys and have not been afforded the opportunity. And for that reason, I am so very, very disappointed in each and every member of this board. My next thing is I have two children going to Cedar Creek. I have one in kindergarten, one in first grade. My first grader is in a room that does not have air conditioned. And numerous times I emailed back and forth with the principal. I've even sent emails to your assistant, uh, the assistant superintendent, and which I included my emails to uh, the principal. I've asked numerous times of how many breaks they were having when it was hot that first and second week of the school. And I was told that she, along with a custodian, were going down to the room and they were checking out the room. I asked if there was a temperature in which they would then go ahead and re, uh, ask all children to remove their masks. That was never done. She says there is no temperature. Uh, so how do you just, you just uh, walk into a room and say, oh yeah, this feels comfortable. No, there should be exact number. If it goes over, let's say 73 degrees in a room, these children should be instructed to take their masks off. That was as per every agreement, as per every notice that the, the Lacey Township had sent out as far as the mask mandates. And I'm very upset that it was not followed. 
I've asked my children every time they come home, where they, how many breaks did you have? They're getting two or three breaks, maybe a day. They're sitting eating in a cubby hole, basically. It is absolutely ludicrous what is going on right now. And in, I, I heard, um, I believe it was the assistant uh, superintendent make a comment, or maybe it was the superintendent made a comment tonight in the beginning stating that we all want the mandates to go away. My question is, do you actually truly believe that one day Governor Murphy or anybody is going to turn to us and say, oh yes, go ahead, take off those masks. No, it's not gonna happen. It's continuously getting worse because the next question is going to be, oh, when are you getting your, your daughters injected with this poisonous vaccine? I could tell you my answer is going to be no. And I will then be pulling both my children out of the school system because that is definitely not happening to my children. I, I can assure you of that. I, I run my own business. And if I ever ran the business the way it's going right now in the state of New Jersey, I understand you guys have mandates, but you guys have the ability to be a little bit more lenient. You have the ability to tell your teachers and principals how to run their classrooms and their schools. And it's not being done. It is being, it is actually being feeling like we are sitting in a, some kind of system where nobody cares about our children. And for that, I will absolutely state that if for, if for some reason you guys cannot start standing up for our children, as a whole, as the board, I am asking for your resignations because this is uncalled for. I should not have my child that was put almost, it, it's almost like she had no kindergarten in comparison to my, my kindergarten this year. It's, it's, and then on top of it, my next question absolutely has to do with how you guys are, are picking and choosing what I understand the contract uh, contact tracing, but how are you going to teach my children when they're being quarantined for 14 days? These K through four year for um, grade four, how are they going to be uh, taught? I can't teach them. I'm not a teacher. I never went to school. There should be like a substitute teacher that is afforded to our child should they get quarantined at that younger age. I understand the older ones, they can go to the live stream. It's a little bit easier. But these kindergarten and first graders, second and third and fourth, they don't, they, they rely on us. And we know what's going to happen. We're going to have dittos to go over with our children. Our children are going to ultimately be, and I hate to say it, walking idiots because they're not being given an, an actual education. This is not America. The education that is being afforded to my children right now is far from good, far from good. I am embarrassed and I'm even more embarrassed by Lacey. I have always held Lacey up high on my pet, on my pedestal as far as the way you guys run you things. And I have never uh, been so disappointed. Five minutes. Sorry to interrupt you, that is five minutes. Okay, Richard Bidnick, please unmute your microphone, state your name and address, and begin your public comment. Can you hear me? Yes, okay. we can, Mr. Bidnick. Good evening, Richard Bidnick. Before I begin, I just wanted to mention that Thursday night's adjournment was just another example of how deplorably low this board has sunk. Another disgrace from a thoroughly disgraceful board. I have been coming to these school board meetings for over a decade. I have watched superintendents come and go, four to be exact. I have watched boards and board members come and go. But the one thing that never changed is the incompetence that I see from this body. They talk about the kids, that it's all about the kids. That's what they used to say years ago, but I'm gonna tell everybody it's not about your children. It's all about the money. That's what it's about. That's why they're keeping the masks on your kids because the money that they're getting from the state and what the governor is doing and the way that he is trying to manipulate and, and, uh, and pull the, the strings to the school districts, it's a disgrace. We have a thing going on now called COVID Nazism. It's the belief that the state should have utter control over our lives dealing with all things concerning with the coronavirus. Individual freedoms no longer exist, and you are subjected to the state's whims on issues from masking to vaccinations, to your own health care, to your livelihood. First, they started with masking your children. 
Next, they're going to try to force vaccinate them. Your employer will fire you if you don't get vaxxed. And if that does not work, you will and still refuse, then the train will be waiting for you to take you to the COVID concentration camps. Mark my word, this is not going to end very well. And this is only the beginning to have a so-called president this absurd person singular in Washington wag his finger at us and tell us that he has lost patience with us because some of us have chosen for whatever reason to not get vaxxed. It gives the impression that we no longer have a representative democracy, but a dictatorship. America's founding fathers must be rolling in their graves. Two board members voted against this mass mandate, but yet when the push comes to shove, on Thursday night, instead of standing up with the public, they just caved. This is lip service, not leadership. The children are suffering and they are suffering because of decisions this board has made. When will it end? I think they plan on masking your kids forever and they will if we don't stop them. The mass majority of this board sadly needs to resign. Quite frankly, we don't want you, we don't need you and you are not representing the people who elected you. We don't care how you feel. We, don't, we didn't elect you for your feelings, but to represent all of us, which you have not been doing. Enough is enough. Already you need to all go. I don't care what your reasoning is. If it's about fear of losing your funding, then you really are a warped bunch, allowing young children to be mentally and emotionally damaged by your horrible actions. If you're afraid of being arrested by the Fuhrer, then you don't deserve to be sitting on any public body. In all honesty, Dr. Clark, I am so ashamed of you. You are a coward. You have made decisions to cover your behind and do not care about the children's best interests at heart. I personally think you are a nice person. I've had meetings with you. You're totally professional with me, but you are totally out of your league in this current situation. If you had courage, you would stand up to this tyranny, which I can't believe that you don't think is morally wrong. If my board had reservations about this, I would have used every power in my tool book to convince them, but I know that is not what happened. We all know this board does not care about how we feel. You try to limit public comment to five minutes to silence us, but you cannot silence us any longer. The sleeping giant has been unleashed and there's no going back. The best thing that members of this board can do right now, and you know who you are, is get out of the way. None of you have any children in these schools, so personally the damage to you is minimal. It's rather a sad state of affairs that I, a person without any children, have to stand here before you today to tell you and instruct you the right thing you need to do. The abuse that you are allowing to happen with these mandates to young children is so appalling and so morally wrong. I personally know what abuse is and to suffer as a child because of it. The damage can never be undone. You have asked young children to endure the unendurable and you are defending the indefensible. Stand down, get out of the way, do the right thing for all of us. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Mr. Bidnick. And Mrs. DeLuca, I'm sorry I didn't get a comment on what you said. We appreciate your concerns, we really do. We're working daily on educating the students and our curriculum committee is working very hard along with Mr. Zielinski and Dr. Clark to find the best practices to educate the students at our quarantine. We're discussing it daily. We're talking to other districts in the state and we're doing all that we can and we appreciate your concerns. So thank you for coming forward and we're constantly working on it. Thank you. Mr. Merman. Morgan Chartarina, please unmute your microphone, state your name and address, and begin your public comment. Hi, my name is Morgan Chartarina. I live at 907 Tappan Street in Forked River. Um, I have three children that attend. Can you guys hear me okay? I'm sorry. Yes, we can, Morgan. Okay, thank you. Um, I have three children that attend the school, um, one, the schools, one in high school, one in Mill Pond, one in elementary. Um, I have quite a few things to say. Um, the first thing that I would like to say is I go to every single high school Friday night football game. My daughter is a varsity cheerleader. Um, Coach V just reached his 300th win. I was so happy to see that. However, I also saw 
about a hundred people, a hundred children, maybe even more coaches included, take a huge thing of water and just, you know, pour it on him and everyone was wet and everyone was involved. And it was such a beautiful, it was a beautiful thing to see. However, it is a very contradictory thing to see because we're all so close on the football field and everyone is hugged up on one another. Football players are getting thrown around from all other areas, wall township, union, uh, brick, uh, where town, wherever they're from, it's all different areas. The cheerleaders are, you know, cheering on, on one another and all of that is okay. These sports are okay. But yet our children sit Monday through Friday in a classroom, six feet apart from one another with masks on their faces. And I feel like that is a very, that is very contradictory from, from what is allowed. And it's like, you guys are like picking and choosing what is allowed and what is not. And I agree a hundred percent that the children should be in sports. Um, them not having sports last year was detrimental to their health. Um, I have tried to be on board with the board of education and how you guys are handling things. We need lions, not sheep. And I say that with respect, but the thing is, if you guys don't stand up for us, as much as you think right now, you're just complying because it's the best thing to do. You're going to be no different than we are when all of this comes down, because all of our rights are at stake if we do not take a stand and fight. Um, I also would like, with all respect, for every single one of you on the board to resign, because we need people on the board that are going to stand up and fight for us like my president before he came out a couple months ago, who was not afraid to stand up and fight for us. We need people like that in Lacey fighting for our children and fighting for this generation because right now it's not looking so good. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Mrs. Chartarina. Mr. Merman. At this time, I do not see any more uh, public comment. Thank you. At this time, we will uh, close. Both your fast, Mrs. McAvoy. We had a couple others uh, pop in there. If you'd okay, like. thank you. Okay, so let me just let, line these up real quickly. Um, so we do have a phone-in caller. Uh, we're going to take that at this time. Uh, so I don't have a name on that one. Please state your name and address and begin your public comment. I believe if you want to uh, make your public comment, it may be star six. Uh, Mr. Lytle, if you're in the background somewhere and you have that, uh, you may need to do that as well. No, I think we got, we have an on mute here. Bruce Halliday, Princeton Road, Lynn, Oklahoma. Harbor. Good evening, Mr. Halliday. We hear you. Hello. Hi. Thank you. I got a different uh, question. Um, can you tell me what the total cost of all of the work that was just done at the uh, schools? Yes, that was $17,000, Mr. Halliday. 17,000. And I just noticed on the website um, last week that the, there's a position of the facilities manager. Was he fired or was he, um, or did he resign? Um, he resigned. And I, did he resign because of uh, the issues that occurred? That's a personnel issue, Mr. Halliday, and I cannot comment on that. Okay. Um, on another note, um, I, I don't know the exact day, but I know it's coming up October 14th or the 18th when unvaccinated teachers have to get tested once a week. Um, are the teachers going to be getting this test on school time and what is the cost of that going to be um, for the teacher because I know there's several other towns that I know the business administrators from that the teachers are responsible for the cost of the test. Can you uh, give me an answer on that? Uh, Mr. Halliday, I'm going to turn this over to Mr. Zielinski and see if he can have give us some input on that. Okay. So um, uh, as of now, uh, the uh, Ocean County Health Department and Health Department uh, in the state of New Jersey has uh, um, surveyed school districts 
as to uh, whether we would be willing to participate in their program for testing. Um, we signed up for it, but they have not given us any details back. Uh, it is our impression, and again, it's an impression because they've given us no details, is that the state was picking up the cost of that testing uh, and possibly providing us with a contractor. Uh, as far as your question about when and where they would be tested, we really need to hear from the state and the Ocean County Health Department and possibly a contractor in order to really figure out those details, um, which we do not have at this time, uh, Mr. Halliday. So uh, more to come on that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Halliday. Is there anyone else, Mr. Merman? Uh, yes, Anthony Rizzoli, you may unmute your microphone, state your name and address and begin your public comment. Good evening, can you hear me? Yes, Mr. Rizzoli, we can. Okay, my question is to the president for the business administrator to answer. My question is at the end of public comment, will the Google forms that were um, sent in for the previous canceled meeting be read at the end of the live public input? Yes. M Mr. DeGeorge? Yes, they will. Yes, they okay. will. So I'll let him ask my questions. Uh, number two, I would request Mr. Zelinsky to answer my email that I sent today. Um, and uh, number three, which I don't think I included, was it was an article about the NJISAA uh, looking to pay high school students or allowing pay to be paid to high school athletes um, for endorsements like they do for college. And I don't know if it's been passed yet, uh, but it's something to think about in the future. Uh, and if in fact it does occur where our student athletes are receiving money um, and the reason they're receiving the money is they happen to be wearing a Lacey Township uniform. A picture of them is being taken on a Lacey Township athletic field in front of a Lacey Township school district sign. And it sounds crazy, but as a taxpayer, I want a piece of the action. Thank you very much for your time. And that's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Rizzoli. Any others, Mr. Merman? Mr. Merman? Sorry about that. I missed the unmute button there. Rebecca J, you may uh, state your name and address and uh, begin your public comment. Hi, this is Rebecca Jugan. I'm at 216 Plumstead Court. And yes, I do have a question. When it comes to the vaccination of status of students, how is that even something that is legal to for anybody to let be known as public? Uh, we are supposed to be teaching our children to not discriminate, to not segregate, and to not bully. However, when it comes to quarantining, you are basically letting them know whose status is what, and that's healthcare, and these are minors. So how do you plan on handling that when it comes to who can quarantine, who cannot, who can actually get their education? I think this is an absolute deplorable way to handle this. We have children that their healthcare and their medical records are nobody else's business. The vaccination. And now, have, and now we have children that are going to be alienated potentially, or that are going to be criticized by their peers because of something that is completely politicized in the educational system and in society. When politics do not belong, nor does our nor do our medical records belong in the public hands. So how okay. do you plan on how do you plan on addressing that, Dr. Clark? Could you please address this? Yeah, thank you, um, Mrs. Jugan. Um, so what I'm going to ask you to do is to uh, it's, uh, again on our website uh, we we posted our health and safety guidance, but we do have a, a very strong statement there um, about vaccinations, and I'm I'm just going to read a, a portion of it, and I think it's going to answer. Dr. Clark, Dr. Clark, I do not mean to be disrespectful. However, I have read that, 
and I understand all of the verbiage. Right. However, so, hold on, but let me, but let me, let me just finish before you comment on what I'm no, going to comment. No, no, excuse me. But when you had, this is a public forum. And when you have students that are being quarantined and some can come back, some cannot, some are on this, some are on that. And different schools have different rules because it was put on the principals to make those rules. So how do you plan on handling that when their peers, especially when they are old enough to understand the differences and understand what those ramifications could be. How do you plan on handling that? I've read those, I, I, I've read your writing, I've read the district's things. I am not incompetent and I can understand them. I, I didn't but say the you children were understand that. Okay, I, I didn't, first of all, I didn't say you were incompetent. And what I was trying to say, and I, I'm gonna address something you said, and we don't have different rules for different schools. I think what you're referring to are the rules related to contact tracing that Mr. Zielinski went over. We have no intention no, of that's not asking, what I'm referring to. We have no intention of asking students about their vaccination status. But when we have to ask questions about contact tracing, that is something we do have to do to keep our students and our staff so, safe. So if you do not have the intention of asking students about their vaccination status, then how can you have different rules for those that are vaccinated for quarantine and those that are not? That doesn't make any sense because then you are obviously asking vaccination status in order that, to accommodate those students. Right, and those conversations are being held in private with our school nurses. That is a function of their job. But I understand that. However, if you think the other students do not understand what that means when they see students that can come back to school and students that cannot. So what you are creating is segregation you are creating a situation where children are obviously knowing when you get, especially to the older grades where the vaccination is, is appropriate with the FDA, where you are creating that because they see their friends being able to go back to school. They see their friends not being able to go back to school. So how is that not discrimination? Mrs. Jugan, um, I don't think that this is the proper forum to debate that. So what I'm going to ask you to really? do is, is for you to board, give, this is what you I'm going to ask you, Mrs. Jugan, to give me a call tomorrow and I will discuss it with you in depth. But this is not the right forum for that because this is public comment, not public discussion. I asked a question to the school board about how you feel and how you are handling certain things and you're telling me that it is private information, yet it technically is not creating a situation that is completely against the morals and objectives of parents, educators, from what I understand, and the school system. How is this not the right forum to ask this question? We okay. appreciate your comments and Dr. Clark asked you to please call her in the morning and you could have a lengthy discussion about it. I will absolutely do that. However, again, I really think this is something that needs to be put out there publicly. Thank you. Okay, Stephanie Zatani, please unmute your microphone, state your name and address and begin your public comment. Hi, uh, my name is Stephanie Zatani. I'm at 206 John Street. Um, one is I want to thank you guys because I think that you guys have gone through enough criticism when you're trying to protect the children during such a hard time. Um, I know that, you know, it stinks to have our kids masks and, you know, it stinks not being able to see their physical expression, especially kindergartners. But for some of the commenters on here, um, it, this is more to address them, is uh, I have two immune compromised children. Um, other people wearing masks keeps them safe at the end of the day. And, you know, I don't think that you guys truly understand what that does. Just, just by putting a mask on prevents my five-year-old from, you know, being put in the hospital and being vented. Um, and I get that there's selfish people out there and you guys don't care about my child, but Lacey Township has done nothing but try to protect every single child in that school 
during such a hard time. And the fact that nobody can understand what they're doing and you guys are looking at the funding and looking at the number is you guys are the disgusting people. They're trying to protect us and they're trying to allow the kids to be in a social situation with limits. They could have them home and be remote and have no socialization, at least they're back in school. So I wanted to thank you guys because I think overall, the school, especially Mr. Fiedler, the school nurse at the Forked River School, and my kids' teachers have done a phenomenal job at making sure that my five-year-old and my uh, nine-year-old are nothing but safe in that classroom. So I thank you guys. This is Zatani from the bottom of my heart, and I'm sure the rest of the board, we really appreciate your comments. You don't know how much that means to us. Thank you for coming on. No problem, thank you. Amanda, please unmute your microphone, state your name and address and begin your public comment. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, this is Amanda Buron, 208 Lakeview Court, Fork River. Um, so I had put a general poll up in all of the Lacey sites, all the Lacey Facebook pages and asked people to please keep it to Lacey specifically, only people with children. I didn't want this to be a mass mandate debut, de you know, discussion or anything. I just wanted it to be the parents. I wanted to get some numbers. And from that poll, there's a few that I need to take out because there are a few that are not in Lacey, but overall, I said, given the chance, if masks were optional, how many of you would send your kids to school with a mask and how many would you said not? 437 parents responded that they wanted to send their kids to school unmasked and only 127 parents who replied, obviously that's a portion of the families in Lacey uh, so that's, let's see, real quick math. That is um, 64, 564 families. So right there, it's a four to one ratio. My kids, I'm hearing a whole bunch of other kids are coming home on these days that you guys already think that the heat is not excessive anymore and the kids are coming home with headaches, their throats are bothering them, they're lightheaded. So my question is, how do we get the information from the nurse's office to see how many kids are going down to the nurse? Because I don't think enough kids are going down to the nurse and the nurse is gonna get bombarded because us parents are not gonna allow our kids to be sitting in school this is still excessive heat if you ask any of us. The ventilation is not great in the school. And our kids are sitting there masked and are not allowed to pull them down. So do I need to Oprah request that information or how do I get the information on how, I don't wanna know who's going down to the nurse. I just wanna know how many children on a daily basis are going down to the nurse for being with headaches, feeling nauseous, or lightheaded. Mr. Zielinski, is that public knowledge or can you comment on that? To my knowledge, it's not uh, because that would be getting into specifics. And typically when you reveal things like that, you can drill down to those numbers. And to my knowledge, even nurse visits is not public knowledge, but um, it's something we can check on, but I'm pretty sure uh, once you get into that threshold of the nurse's office, that's where the, the confidential uh, uh, moment starts typically. So even if we didn't want children's names, we don't want their ages, we don't want what grade they're in, I just want numbers. That's what I want. That's, I'm a statistics person and I'd really like to crunch the numbers for you guys because I don't think, one, I, I know that only a small fraction of the children are going down to the nurse to begin with. And we need to change that because you guys need to know that that form needs to be filled out four, five, 
six times a day that that form should be overturned with the amount of kids that are coming home and telling us parents that they're lightheaded, nauseous, or they have migraines. And I would also like to know who makes the deciding factor on what's excessive heat and what's not. Mr. Zielinski, do you want to comment on that? So we do that in combination uh, between the district office and the principals. Um, we watch the numbers, heat index. We never put a number on it. We did that on purpose because heat on some days is different than heat on different days. Um, we have been in contact with the principals for specific locations that might be heating up faster than others, uh, even if we had to do um, specific classroom locations. But overall, we've been a little lucky uh, being under 80 degrees um, since last Thursday. Uh, long range, we're in the low 70s, and we're even going to hit 60 degrees next week, so we're hoping. Um, again, uh, we are in constant contact with the principals. It's the best we can do uh, under extremely difficult uh, situations. Um, you know, our numbers of quarantines are well down uh, because of mask wearing. Uh, I know that doesn't help what Ms. Biron is saying, and I, I appreciate the comments. Uh, but uh, from some perspective, that is, is good for the students' education. Another parent commented how uh, the students who are forced to stay home don't get exactly the same, especially at the elementary level. Uh, mask wearing has helped us cut those numbers significantly, even in one week. Uh, and we'll return the rest of those students back to class uh, who were quarantined in the first couple of weeks of school because of the optional mask wearing. Uh, we had large numbers of quarantine individuals. But again, just back to your question, Mr. Aaron, I'm sorry. Um, we never put a number on it. Uh, we just watch it. We watch it daily. We watch it weekly, um, you know, just to make sure that the, the, the things that, you, that you're, you're commenting on, like kids with headaches, that we just try to keep them to a minimum. Uh, I have visited the nurse's office over time. Uh, I haven't seen, like you say, I haven't seen large numbers of students in the nurse's office. We always encourage our students to visit the nurse. Our teachers are instructed that students should never be denied going to the nurse um, because, you know, they are the frontline defense to make sure that our students are, are getting through the day well. Um, so thank you. I think. So who, how often does someone and who is the person that reviews the nurse's records to make the call to see if children are suffering with the masks on or not. Is that reviewed on a daily basis? Is it reviewed on a weekly basis? And who's in charge of reviewing that information? We do a week weekly nurse meeting uh, with Mr. Bond, our director of student services, uh, and they are extremely vocal when they want something. So if they were having big numbers, they would certainly tell us. Ms. Buren, that's your, uh, that's your time, I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, is there any other public comment, Mr. Merman? Seeing none, Mrs. McAvoy. Okay, we will close public comment. We will have Mr. DeGeorge read the comment, the questions and comments that came on the Google Forms, please. Mr. DeGeorge, can you unmute, please? Thank yes, you. Yes, I am trying to find them. Uh, give me one second, please. All right. First one from Mr. Rizzoli, and these are in no certain order. General comment, Mr. George, thank you for earlier posting of this current agenda. You are welcome. Uh, second. Stephanie Gennaro, 1716 Key West Road. Uh, good evening, as a parent of three children in the Lacey School District, FRS and MP, my biggest concern with masking is that a large number of the classrooms are not air conditioned. This is unfair to students and teachers alike. Yes, it is starting to cool down now, but come May and June, the classrooms will become uncomfortable once more. This is an issue that existed before COVID and will continue to exist once this is all over. My question is, has there been any discussion or plan to expand air conditioning to all classrooms? If so, what is the plan? If not, what needs to be done to make this a priority? Um, how would you like that answered? Mr. DeGeorge, could you um, comment on that, please? Sure, yes. Uh, yes, ma'am. We have been at uh, several subcommittees, ad hoc committee levels, starting to talk about what air conditioning might look like. 
uh, across the district, how much that might cost in consultation with our architect of record. There are many related conversations, uh, which really kind of take into account all of the future projects that the district may wish to undertake. One of them is redistricting and the uh, possibility of projects related to that. In a referendum, uh, there are two capital projects. We are doing a couple of HVAC projects in the 22-23 school year that are funded by grant money, but uh, these are all conversations which are going to have to take place at one time, but I can tell you it's probably a uh, multi-million dollar discussion, which uh, is something that we would have to talk about a, uh, an appropriate, if there is such a thing, increase in taxes through a referendum, but I don't have a definitive answer for you as to when that might be. Thank you, Mr. DeGeorge. Sure, next, uh, Mr. Rizzoli, B4 policy R3221 does the revision wording in this policy slash document address the issue of a teacher inputting personal views into curriculum material that is in opposition to the Lacey School District mission statement. Again, I bring up how history is taught in this district and how it is communicated to our students. Will the teachers be held accountable with this new wording? Okay, Dr. Clark, could you please comment on that? Sure. Um, so I, I think Mr. Rizzoli, you might be referring to a few policies we have. One is policy 2200 curriculum content. And the second one is policy 3310 academic freedom. So um, our, our curriculum is, you know, we don't just make up curriculum. It's based on the um, NJSLA, the New Jersey Student Learning um, Standards. I'm sorry, NJSLS. Um, and so the policy that I refer to, curriculum content, talks about that. Um, the fact that the Board of Education will provide instruction and services mandated by law and rules as necessary for the implementation of a thorough and efficient public education Education, but they are based on the New Jersey student learning uh, standards. And then in terms of academic freedom, um, policy 3310, um, the middle paragraph there is the one that's important where it says that the board recognizes that some deviation from the course guide is necessary to the free exchange of ideas within the classroom, um, but again, must uh, stay within the con confines of uh, the curriculum. So that is my answer to your question. Thank you, Dr. Clark. Mr. Any more, Mr. DeGeorge? Yes, just a couple of uh, quick ones. Uh, again, Mr. Rosoli gives a link to a patch.com article referencing uh, 20 Hillsborough High School students being named National Merit semifinalists. His question is, how many were named from Lacey High School this year? Uh, I, um, Mr. DeGeorge, we, we typically get those by letter uh, in the principal's office when we do get a semifinalist. Um, I have not gotten any yet, but I will check on that and I'll uh, report back next meeting. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you, Mr. Zelensky. Uh, again, Mr. Rosoli, uh, there's an attachment B13, I guess 313 for assignment of additional duties. Does this policy change with use management prerogative rights at all? Is the employee still required to perform the job as directed by management immediately and then grieve the function for compensation? Or does this policy revision change allow the employee to not immediately perform the directed managerial order until it is negotiated with the union? Managerial rights should not be relinquished under any circumstances. I do not want the tail wagging the dog. Mr. DeGeorge, could you comment on that, please, as much Probably. as you can, because it's personal? I really am not, unfortunately, familiar with that. Uh, the policy, I guess, 3334 that he's referring to, um, so I really cannot. Uh, I do not have the knowledge of that. Okay. But Dr. Clark, um, could you comment a little bit? Yeah, I can. Um, the, the policy um, that Mr. Rizzoli is referring to is 3134 assignment of extra duty. So the answer to his question is no. Um, it, it, it does not change the managerial, managerial prerogative. This policy simply 
is um, just talking about the evaluation criteria and the evaluation rubrics that uh, districts must implement. So that is the purpose of uh, 3134, it has really nothing to do with um, some of the things that he talks about here in his question. So the answer is no. And then Mrs. McAvoy, there's just one more, but um, it is from Mr. Rizzoli, but in the, please enter your public comment below. It is, uh, oh, just to say to me, please use the pre-submitted Google forms I sent for this meeting before it was ended. Uh, I believe we've done that. Okay, thank you, Mr. DeGeorge. And that will end our public comment. At this time, we will transition over to committee reports. And Mr. Scanlon, would you like to start with our finance and facilities report? Uh, yes, uh, very uh, getting ready for the school year this year. Uh, I hope everyone has had an opportunity to look at the uh, outsides of the schools. There was quite a bit of work done there uh, in the last um, couple of weeks before school, including last weekend. Um, and uh, I think it's important that the students feel comfortable that they are going into a, a building that is cared for and that we care about. Uh, some of the uh, items that were of note that were taken care of uh, over the um, it, it, over the um, Summer, uh, of course, was uh, some of the repairs around the outsides of the building, some sidewalk and some uh, blacktop uh, repairs, hole patches and so on and so forth uh, that were becoming an issue. Uh, we had to repair the walk-in cooler at the high school. And uh, there uh, are a couple of interesting projects that uh, we, we are working on. The exterior lighting at the schools, at two schools, uh, and that cost is uh, $574,000. And then the HVAC projects at various schools for a total of $1,800,000, which comes to a grand total of 200, uh, excuse me, comes to a grand total of $2,374,000, which sounds like a lot of money until we realize that this is all grant money. So it's all federal money paying for this. This is a uh, safety grant and ESSER grant money. And uh, it's just an example of us putting to the best possible use funds that we get. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Scanlon. Mrs. Downing, could you please report on curriculum? Sure, thank you, Mrs. McAvoy. Um, we had a curriculum meeting on September 13th and attendance was uh, Mrs. McAvoy, Mr. Polino, Dr. Clark, Mr. Zelinsky, and myself. Uh, one of the things we reviewed was the back to school uh, bus handbook, which uh, parents are receiving as school is has started. And just a reminder to everyone that please um, watch the buses, watch the lights. You should not be passing a bus if the lights are on. And I've seen that more often than not in the last couple of weeks. So please be cognizant of that. Um, we reviewed the K through 12 textbook lists and curriculum materials, and this is a living document. So as more curricular items or books are added, we'll add them as the year progresses. There are a couple items. I know um, Mrs. DeSenza question, there was one, I believe 1985 or 95. Uh, some of those books are just held on as a, a reference that could be used or not actually the textbooks being used but they use them as um, additional information. Mr. Zelinsky, is that good? You wanna to add to that? Yeah, yeah. We, you might see some older documents on the textbook list, but they're strictly reference materials for teachers. Sometimes the new stuff just isn't better and they've held on to some of the older stuff. They might make copies, they might refer to it, but they're not in children's hands. Thank you. Uh, we are also, we are approving tonight um, at our board meeting, um, different curricular, um, resources for the teachers. Uh, for example, K-36 Moby Max, New Zell, uh, in, um, IXL Learning Math, they're all on the agenda tonight. And these are curricular purchases that we'll be evaluating as we use them all year to see if they're still um, in demand and really meet our goals. 
but they are requested by the teachers that they're very popular in use. Uh, September and October Parent University, they're actively planning for the uh, parent universities, which were successful last year. Uh, one of the first ones is gonna be the Social Emotional Learning and Mental Health Resource Parent University. And October, November, they're planning on technology resources for parents, including Google Classroom and Real-Time Parent Portal. So keep your eye on the website and I'm sure you'll be getting emails when these are available. Um, YouTube changes, Mr. Zielinski spoke briefly of the changes coming to YouTube to include the offering of a YouTube for kids that will be available for grades K through six. And also uh, Mr. Zielinski informed the committee that the guidance department will develop and disseminate a monthly newsletter specific to guidance related topics for parents and students. So every school has a newsletter that you can click on and read, and now the guidance department will also have one as well. And let's see. Uh, we also have, um, give me one second. I don't have much light in this room, so I'm struggling here. Uh, we submitted our application to the ROTC, junior ROTC. And I think that's it for now, Mrs. McAvoy. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Downing. Next, we will have Mr. Peters with a policy committee report, please. Thank you, President McAvoy. Uh, myself, Ms. Claus, Ms. Senza met at 4 p.m. on September 14th to discuss policies 3142, 3221, 3222, 1648, and 1648 dash oh three um spoke about a couple of things we spoke about homeschooling dr clark had a brief discussion regarding students and who were homeschooling we talked about the ocean county college she left a discussion regarding a number of seats available for the non-resident tuition paying high school students and the district's ocean county community college program and that's about it Thank you, Mr. Peters. Thank you. Next, we will transition over to board comments. Mrs. Desenza, could we start with you, please? One moment. I have to get to my screen. Um, okay. Welcome back to everyone and special thanks to the staff that made all the schools so shiny and beautiful. Congratulations to the seniors of the month, Anthony Cooper and Alexis Frazee. Time sure flies. Alexis used to trick or treat at my house, so I know her a very long time. Congratulations also to Votech Senior of the Month, Kira Rhino. Congratulations to unsung hero, Kaylin Dean. I hope everyone took a few moments to think about and reflect on the tragic events of the September 20th anniversary of September 11th, 2001. It hits me very hard because I grew up watching those towers be built. I had friends and neighbors in them. On Tuesday, August 24th was kindergarten orientation at the Forked River School. It was very well attended. The building was immaculate and in great condition for its age. Sincerest thanks to the custodial staff for creating such a welcoming environment for the students and thank you to all who make this district shine. Wednesday evening, August 25th was the Mill Pond fifth grade orientation. Thankfully, it was held outside at the Cedar Creek Pavilion on the lawn. It was very well attended. Good luck to all the new fifth and sixth graders at Mill Pond. On Thursday evening, August 26th was freshman orientation at the high school. Due to weather concerns, the orientation was held in the high school gym. Chromebooks were handed out after the orientation. And Tuesday, September 2nd was a session at the high school for the new students to find their classes. Good luck to all our freshmen. You'll get used to the building. It just takes time. On Saturday, August 28th, was the Municipal Alliance 5K race at Gilly Park. Over 265 people finished the race and many more attended to cheer the runners on. Thank you to all the students and staff who supported and assisted the Municipal Alliance with all of the details of coordinating the 5K. It was a great morning and the weather was just right. Congratulations to the Lacey track team. 
Tuesday afternoon, August 31st, with the seventh grade orientations at the Lacey Middle School. All three sessions were very well attended. I encourage all parents of this district to please join the parent teacher groups at each school. Someone recently wrote the board and accused us of having no backbone, and I really resent that comment. We show up, we're not hiding from anyone, and we have legal advice. We do not operate on a whim. We've done something that you've never done before, and that's run for a board seat. Please do it, and then feel free to berate us. It's a very different feeling from the other side of the table. The bottom line right now is kids need to be back in school for in-person instruction. Enough time was lost. Everyone should have November 2nd noted on their calendar or get an absentee ballot immediately. Make sure you vote. Please do not let apathy prevail. Yes, we serve the people that elected us. However, on any given day, there's an amount of people who are okay with masks and then there are those before us who are not okay with masks. The board does not run the district. We provide oversight. There is only one person we hire and that is the superintendent. Dr. Clark runs the district along with her administration, not the board. I'd also like to take a moment to let the public know that we are all members of the New Jersey State School Board Association. We are elected officials, we are volunteers. We receive absolutely positively no compensation for sitting here in these seats. The New Jersey School Board Association sends us a bi-monthly magazine called School Leader. You, the public, can find the PDF version. The articles contained therein are very interesting and cover a wide variety of current important topics. The summer 2021 issue is definitely worth reviewing. The other publication we receive bi-weekly bi -weekly, is called the School Board Notes. The July 31st edition contains a few interesting articles as well. We also get updates on certain legal cases. And we just got another School Board Notes edition this past week, September 15th. Next year, I wish more parents would consider running for the three board seats that will be expired. This means three like-minded people can bond with one existing board member and gain control. Four is a majority and majority rules. I will be happy to speak with anyone who wants to know more about the role of becoming a school board member. I have lots of training materials that I can share and I can walk anyone through the New Jersey School Board Association website. My cell phone number is 609-290-5125. Call me, text me anytime 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. You are welcome to contact me anytime. I have a current dispute of my own with the board over documentation. I have consulted with the board attorney, Mr. Padula, and I am paying for his time myself because I don't wanna be accused of running up the legal bill. I am still accused of breaking the code of ethics from the 2019 election. And those four cases have yet to be decided, but I will tell you this, the legal tab is now nearly $50,000. However, that doesn't come out of the district budget those bills are being handled by the district's insurance company. All board members are covered by indemnity insurance. I asked for a document which was noted on the legal bill in July that both I and Mrs. Claus were never given a copy of. I was denied the copy upon request when in the past I had received two same similar such documents. Mr. Padula agreed with my one point. There is no board bylaw or policy prohibiting the distribution of that document. Even though I had received the document in question twice in the past, it proves my point that our board runs with insufficient and non-specific generic bylaws so that people can decide on a whim who gets what and when. Since 2017, I've been asking for this situation to be corrected with more specific detailed bylaws. And without a majority, nothing gets done. Nothing gets done. We need four people in agreement to update any board bylaws. Sometimes only two or three are in agreement. I have even offered copies of pre-written bylaws with the information needed and no one wants to do it. Why? Because for over 40 years, this board chooses to fly by the seat of its pants for lack of a better term. In 2015 and 2017, I was given the document and now with a new non-conflicted board member here, Mrs. Claus, I cannot properly mentor her with a 2021 copy. 
I will have to use one of my older copies to review with her. Every board member should have equal access to the same documentation unless another board member possesses, unless there is a specific bylaw or policy prohibiting it. This situation goes against everything I learned at the training sessions with the New Jersey School Board Association. Either Mr. Armato or Ms. Buran will be in for a rude awakening because one of them is definitely going to be elected November 2nd. I chose not to litigate the matter at this time because in three months my term is up. And I think this board has run up the insurance legal bill more than enough on the four ethics cases. In fact, I don't know what's gonna happen when the legal fees hit 100K because that's the cap on the insurance payout for the cases. The state deputy attorney general's office has taken over my case, Mr. Rossi's case, and Ms. Marcatello's case against Mr. Giordano. And therefore, I no longer have control over how those cases proceed. However, with three months left to my term, Mrs. McAvoy, Mrs. Polino, Mr. Peters, Mrs. Downing, and former board members, Mr. Mirandi and Mr. Giordano are continuing their case against me. And by January, I will be a private citizen. Did their case make any sense? No, not yet, but did it make a lot of money for their attorneys? Yes, it did. There is no gag order on any of the cases. Therefore, I can discuss them freely. Thank you for joining us tonight. The next regular business meeting is scheduled for Thursday night, October 21st. I'm sure I'll be hearing from somebody's lawyer this week. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Desenza. Mrs. Claus, could we have your comments, please? Sure. Good evening. After last month's meeting and last Thursday night, I had some time to reflect. One of the main things that really stood out to me was definitely the frustration of board members, parents, and our community. We all want to be respected for our values and views, but most importantly, be heard. I have gotten many calls saying it looked like we, the board, um, I'm sorry, put up a wall last month. We did not answer questions like the past meetings and were very upset the order of the agenda was changed so their voices could not be heard before the vote. So moving forward, how can we come together? I'm proposing the board and administration discuss offering a round table to discuss hot topics in an intimate setting and maybe a few board members, a few admin and a few community residents can attend. This round table has been done in the past when tensions were high and dialogue was needed. This might lower the temperature in our meetings. I'm sure our governor is not done with the executive orders and will continue to make things difficult for us. Since he has been in office, he has implemented 264 executive orders and more to come. This round table might help bring more of an understanding about the policies he's mandating and bridge us together. It's just an idea, but I think something different should be tried so we can all focus on one goal and that's supporting the kids. I would also like to congratulate Coach Lou Versillo and his historic 300th win two weeks ago, now 301. Coach Versillo has been the only head football coach in Lacey history, and I believe only Lacey employee in history to educate for over 40 years. He has led the Lions to 13 conference championships and four state titles. He has also been awarded the Shore Football Coaches Foundation Hall of Fame as well as receiving the Ray McCrand Lifetime Achievement Award, just to name a few. He has instilled family, which they call the brotherhood, pride and tradition in these young men. Congratulations again to someone who continues to educate and mentor his students and his coaching staff in his 41st Lacey year. That's it, thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Mr. Peters, please. Thank you, President McAvoy. Uh, first, I'd like to congratulate Alexis Frazee, Anthony, Mason, Kayla, and Kira. I'd like to make a recommendation to the board that our next meeting that we attempt in person, we possibly bring those students back to recognize them in person. They deserve that. They've yep. worked hard. They deserve that have in person. So hang on one second. I'm, out, I'm outside and uh, Carl O'Reilly's off to reply. My apologies. So um, I would like to bring them back in person and actually uh, award them. Yes. Um, I do have a question for Dr. Clark and Mr. Zelinsky. Um, with the students that are being sent home uh, once they're quarantined, are we allowing extra time for the teachers to generate work for them? I realize Mr. Zelinsky said that 
some of the teachers are doing a live class in the high school, but like the younger teachers or the middle school, their schedule is extremely hectic. Me being a teacher also coming back to a full class in September, but the, the students that are actually home for those 14 days, are we allowing a certain time of the day? And if so, when is that time for the teachers to prepare to do the work for the students that are home? So, Dr. Clark? Yep. Um, so, Mr. Peters, that's a great question, but I mean, that that the response is going to vary by grade. I mean, of course, we are making a ton of accommodations because at the end of the day, we want our students to succeed. And because the virtual option was uh, removed, and remember, we didn't do that, um, I'm, I'm fairly certain that if we had that vir virtual option, things would look different. Um, but it's going to vary greatly depending on whether that student is in kindergarten or that student is in high school and then everything in between. Um, but we are absolutely um, allowing accommodations um, while that student is on quarantine. And we're certainly allowing time for work to be made up. What the question I have is Dr. Clark, these teachers have regular schedules prior to coming in September. So if they're having their prep and they're having their lunch and then they're teaching their classes, when are we giving them the actual allocated time to, to work with those students that are home and send work home or whatever? I don't know if they're doing, are they doing any Google Meets afterwards? You know, from the time that the last class the students were dismissed and then the teachers dismissed, how are we addressing that? So again, that's going to vary, but like Mr. Zielinski said earlier, middle school and high school, the students have the ability to participate in live stream. So while that teacher is teaching, the kids that are sitting in front of her, she's got the camera on so the students who are at home are watching the instruction. So it's a, it's static, right? But asynchronous, meaning it's going on at the same time. At the elementary grades, um, each of the buildings, um, like Mill Pond is gonna differ from the elementaries. Mill Pond has a set uh, time when the teacher can log on to a Google Meet and meet with those students who um, are on quarantine at the elementary, it's gonna look a little different, but there is time allotted. Um, you know, is it enough? No, because nothing is, nothing can replace in-person instruction. So um, every day we're coming up with creative ways on how we can do that without having the ability to use virtual the way we did last school year. And we're constantly meeting to explore that um, and explore those options to see how we can do it better. Okay, thank you. That's the end of my comments. Thank you, Mr. Peters. Mr. Scanlon. I would like to uh, also congratulate the uh, seniors of the month, Anthony Cooper and Alexis Frazee, the vocational senior of the month, Kira Rhino, and the unsung hero, Caitlin Dean. And I would also like to chime in and agree with what uh, Mr. Peters said that it really would be great if we could bring them back next month. I know it'll mean that we'll have seniors in a month from two months, but uh, if they can come in person and uh, be presented by the board with their certificates. Uh, I do think it's important that we, we uh, continue to recognize them to the, uh, to the highest level. And uh, I would just, uh, other than that, I would like to thank uh, the staff of all the schools for the getting a successful opening, getting us started in the school year uh, in, under very difficult circumstances, uh, but managing to keep their heads above water and getting it done, getting the job done and moving forward. Uh, thank you to all. Thank you. Mrs. Downing, please. Thank you, Mrs. McAvoy. I too would like to uh, congratulate our unsung hero, Caitlin Dean, um, for a great honor, as Dr. Clark said earlier, Unsung Hero to me is the most important award of all because you're not looking for recognition, but you're always there behind the scenes doing what has to get done. And I really have a lot of respect for them. I also would like to congratulate Alexis Frazee, student of the month for September. Um, I remember Alexis in eighth grade and um, you know, I think she made the speech at eighth grade graduation. I could be wrong, but I thought, wow, she's going to end up being in student council government or a class president or something by the time she's a senior. And here we are. She, it's, she's there at Georgetown. What a great university. Congratulations, Alexis. Anthony Cooper, 
Another one, another great student, September student of the month. Anthony, congratulations. Um, you're always also there and uh, you have, you're a great role model for all the other seniors to follow you now. And looking forward to hearing where you're going to college. So congratulations. And Kira Rhino, vocational student of the month, becoming a nurse. In my opinion, the most important occupation, uh, most demanding occupation out there. Um, so lots of luck to you and uh, stay well with whatever training you have or are going to be having soon. Mr. George, thank you for doing the school budget. School budget is so different than personal budgets, a lot harder to understand and with all the rules and guidelines. So thank you for presenting that again this year. It's always good to have a refresh every year. Um, I want to welcome Alexis and Mason Heck as our senior um, students of the month or students on the board. We look forward to working with you all year. And I'd like to thank everybody in the district that have opened these school doors to our students to make it as normal as possible. Um, and a lot of happy faces coming into school. I know the kids want to be in school. And um, so thank you for everything you did, all of you, teachers, custodians, bus drivers, cafeteria, it, uh, your um, good, good, uh, good help. Your efforts are really acknowledged and we appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Polino, please. Thank you. <clears throat> so like, like everyone, I congratulate our new uh, student representatives to the board and all our award winners um, this month. Um, unfortunately, you couldn't be in person. Um, and that brings me to last Thursday. And it, it seems like nobody wants to speak about that, but I feel like I need to. <clears throat> last Thursday, the behavior on some of the people in that audience was deplorable. It was disgusting and disrespectful. The words I heard some of the members of the audience calling the superintendent and myself was uncalled for. One of the parents, and I'm not going to mention his or her name, realized that and actually sent me a very nice apologetic email. And I responded back and I thank you for that. There was no reason for anybody to be acting like that in front of children and then going out in the parking lot with children around and beating their chest and whatever platform they think they're standing on to do that. I'm wondering to think that if there was no election, what type of platform they'd be running for right now. <clears throat> People have to take responsibility. Some people get up and say they're disappointed in each and every one of us for not, for not staying there and giving the opportunity and tell people to leave. We don't need to tell grown adults that you're in violation of a law, an executive order, and that you need to be told and asked to be put a mask on. You're adults. What are you teaching the children that are sitting in the audience to be defiant? <clears throat> It wasn't arguing. You need to take responsibility. Those of you that were not masked, take responsibility for the fact that we didn't have a meeting. We went to that meeting Thursday night knowing that it was going to be a rough night. We could have chose to go behind a screen last Thursday, but we decided not to. We wanted to give the public a chance to come up in person to speak to us. But unfortunately, some members of that congregation that night dictated what was going to happen. It wasn't our doing, it was your doing. So those of you that sat there with your smirks on your face and disregarded the board president and- Mr. Polino, you're muted right now. Mm. Mr. Polino? Mm. Mr. Polino. I understand too that when we have a meeting, it is not a question and answer time for us to conduct business with the public. We conduct business in public. That is what a board meeting is for. I need to address Mr. Bidnick. For the last 10 years, Mr. Bidnick, since I've become acquainted with you, I've sat there and I've listened to your rhetoric. I've listened to you disrespect pull out, degrade, throw stones from a very thin glass house that you live in. I don't understand what your stake is, and you have no children here, but you have to call us out and say, we have no children in this, the district, so what stake do we have? 
my son asked me the same question. He goes, Dad, why do you put up with some of these disrespectful parents? You have no children in school. And I told him, I said, you know why? Because I have stake in this community. I have a stake here. I pay taxes just as well as anybody else. And the fact is, I have stake in all the children in this township to see that they're well-educated and they go out into other parts of the state or the country or in the world and do better and do good. So I do have a stake. Just because I don't have children going through K through 12 doesn't mean I don't care. doesn't mean the rest of us don't care. We do care. So, Mr. Bidding, I don't understand what your dealing is with, with government agencies. And why is it only the school boards you come and attack? And you said it wonderfully. Have you watched boards come and go? And you've seen superintendents come and go. But you still have the same resentment towards anybody who sits in the seat. I don't know. Maybe it has to do with the fact of your dealings with the Bell Borough Council back in 2000. When you were public library director, you had an issue. And you were investigated by the county prosecutor's office and the local police chief. And ultimately, you were removed from their board. So maybe that's where it's coming from. We're out here doing the right thing and trying to do the right thing. We're not professionals. We're not educated board members where we go to school to be a board representative. We learn by the seat of our pants and we try to do the right thing. And you know, and again, you're good to stand up there. You, you throw rocks from that glass house. And like Mrs. DeSenza said, and I, Mrs. DeSenza, I got to tell you, you had a great public comment two thirds of the way. But you know what? I never seen your name on a ballot. Never seen it. Mr. Amato's been there three times now, and Mrs. Bjorn's going for it. You know what? Put your money where your mouth is. Take your pen out, sign up, and get on the school board and see how it is on the other side. And maybe you won't throw those stones. From what I'm concerned, where I'm at now, everything you said, everything you say is rhetoric. In the words of Donald J. Trump, it's fake news. And I'm done hearing about it. You refer to us all, all the time as, as Nazis and Führers. We're a democracy. We vote. There's seven of us. The dictatorship, if you're not familiar, is one person. We're not one person. There's seven of us. And that's how we decide, by seven of us. Stop standing up there throwing rocks. I've, I've dealt with people for 36 years like you, standing behind the rock telling everybody what they should do, and you better do this, and you better do that, and this is how it's done. You know what? Come out from behind your rock. Sign up and vote and get out here and be on a board. I think I've said enough. And you know what? And there, actually, one other thing I have to say, and, and, and I've heard it the last two meetings. No, not the last meeting because it was 30 seconds long, thanks to the public. But they tell us how this executive order is not law, and we don't have to abide by it. Well, you know what? It is. It's not a specific law. Let me educate for those that, like Mr. Bidnick says, that it's not a law. We don't have to listen to this. So in this Constitution of New Jersey, which, by the way, there was three, the last one in 1947, the office of the governor is given explicit direction. It's either constitutional, it's either statutory, or it's implied. There's no specific language given the governor of New Jersey, the legal authority written, to come up with an executive order. However... In the governor's office section, it says the executive powers are bestowed to the office of governor. That is implied. The governor has the right to do that. And these executive orders are forced by law. So those of you that stand up there and say, you have no backbone, stand up for us. You're telling us as the elect officials to violate our oath and go against the Constitution of New Jersey. So I'll tell you folks, the ones that say we have no backbone. Start driving around, go through red lights, start drinking and hit people. Stop paying your taxes. Let's, just have, let's see how far you get. You won't do that, but yet you'll stand up there and tell us that we're not doing the right thing. We are doing the right thing. We take an oath, and we stand up for what we are, took our oath for. We're elected officials. We can't just openly violate the law. Listen, this is not the best situation we have here, and we don't agree. It's, every day, it's, it's, it's a fluid thing, and it changes. And and I and I forgive me for for screwing up your last name. Is, is it Jugan? I don't know. But what you say between vaccinated and unvaccinated children and how they may be alienated and picked up or chosen, I'm interested in that. And I think you might be right on that. And I'd like to see how we could change that. And I will speak to the superintendent about that and the board president. But we're not going to openly violate the law. We're going to work through this as a community, and we'll do what we have to do. 
to get through this. You know what, 10 years from now, we could look at this and say, that, that was the worst thing we ever did. Or they say, you know what, we're lucky we did that. We don't know. Only time will tell. There's going to be a lot, a lot of doctor doctor thesis out there evaluating this pandemic and how it, how it affected our children all around the world and the adults and business. We're all doing this by the seat of our pants. We're, 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 we're flying and we're, we're trying to figure it out. So with that, I bid you all good night and thank you. Thank you, Mr. Polino, for your passionate remarks. And for my comments, I want to reiterate what everyone else said. Congratulations to all the fall, the students of the month. And um, Alexis, I enjoyed watching you play tennis today. And Anthony, I loved following your volleyball career in the spring. I was one of your fans and I went to many of your games. And speaking of the athletes, it's so wonderful being outside watching the kids be able to participate in sports. I've attended the football game, the tennis, the soccer, the field hockey, and the gymnastics meet so far. And it's beautiful out. I invite the whole community to go out any day of the week and see the athletes doing their thing. It feels good. And as far as the schools being open, I reiterate what Mrs. Downing said, thank you to everybody who had a stake in opening the schools. We all know that the kids need to be in school and that's what we're working hard to do every day to keep the kids in school. They need it for socialization, for their education, for their overall well-being. So thank you to every single person the teachers, the paras, the nurses, the nurses' aides, the custodians, the administration, the cafeteria workers, everyone for going the extra step to make sure that the kids stay in school. Dr. Clark, I loved your quote from um, Larry Feinsod. He's the executive director of New Jersey School Boards. I had the pleasure of having a lengthy discussion with him last week on the state of school boards. And we spoke in length about finding common ground. He said in the 53 years of him being in education, this is the year that is the toughest. And the school boards, the district, we have to find a common ground and work toward that goal. We know this is unprecedented times and we need to practice kindness, compassion, respect. Everyone is here. For the kids, I know you don't think, some people don't think we are, every single one of us is here for the kids. We all have Lacey pride. We all care about the community we live in, AC Township. And with that being said, we will start to conduct our board business. So board members, please look at your agendas. Please unmute yourselves. <clears throat> and I would like the motion for number one, the meeting minutes. Motion, Polito. Second. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Mrs. Claus. Yes. Mr. Scanlon. Yes. Mr. Peters. Yes. Mrs. DeSensa. Yes. Mrs. Downing. Yes. Mr. Polino. Yes. Mrs. McAvoy. Yes. Next is number two. And num number two, the list of bills. A motion, please. I'll make that motion. I'll second, second it. Mm, Any discussion? It. Roll call, please. Mrs. Claus. Yes. Mr. Scanlon. Yes. Mr. Peters. Yes, and I'd like to abstain on one seven three two five one, please. Yes, thank you, Mrs. Desenza. I'm going to abstain on nine five three two nine zero. Um, nay, on thirty five clothing items, I will send you a list, and yes, on all others. Thank you for that list. Appreciate it, Mrs. Downing. Um, yes, uh, except I'm going to abstain on bill number nine five zero four five zero. Due to conflict. 
And I'm also going to abstain on payment to Dr. Clark and Dr. King, number 524950. Thank you. Mr. Polino. Yes, I need to abstain on 954794. And yes, on the rest. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. McAvoy. Yes. Next, we're moving on to numbers three and four, budget transfers. Motion, please. Motion, Regina. I'll second. Second, Peters. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Mrs. Claus? Yes. Mr. Scanlon? Yes. Mr. Peters? Yes. Mrs. DeSenso? Yes. Mrs. Downing? Yes. Mr. Polino? Yes. Mrs. McAvoy? Yes. Next items five to seven. Reporting the sale of solar renewable energy credits and the sailor disposal of assets. Motion, please. I'll make Move. that motion. Second. Any discussion? Yes. I have a question on the uh, high low activity chair. Can I get a little explanation on that, please? What I'm that sorry. is, Mr. <laughs> George? You know what that is? Can you for a bus? Can you repeat that? I'm sorry. The um, sale of disposal of assets. Oh, number seven. Yes. Yes. The high low activity chair. Yes. That automated yes. chair for special needs children. Yes. This child was in our district and we purchased that equipment for this child. The child has since transferred to Tom's River School District and we are selling uh, that equipment at cost to the Tom's River School District to accommodate that same child. Gotcha. So we purchased it specifically for that child, specific yes. item. And he transferred to Tonsville. Okay, thank yes, you. Sir. That's correct. Okay, roll call, please. Mrs. Claus. Yes. Mr. Scanlon. Yes. Mr. Peters. Yes. Mrs. DeSenso. Yes. Mrs. Downing. Yes. Mr. Polino. Yes. Mrs. McAvoy. Yes. Next, we have items 8 to 13, facilities-related items. Can we have a motion, please? Motion. Who, who, who was that? It was two people? Mrs. DeSenza. Okay. And Mrs. Claus. Second. Okay, awesome. Great. Thank Any you. discussion? Uh, no. These are these are a couple of the items that I mentioned in my report. Uh, the uh, HVAC replacement, the interior lighting, uh, the replacement of the walk-in freezer, so on and so forth. Right. Mrs. Uh, McAvoy, I just wanted to note uh, the revision in number 10, where we eliminated one of the two uh, companies that were on last Thursday's agenda, uh, leaving the one who from whom we have uh, the only valid quote. Fair enough? Thank you. Sure. Can we have a roll call, please? Mrs. Claus? Yes. Mr. Scanlon? Yes. Mr. Peters? Yes. Mrs. DeSenza? Yes. Mrs. Downing? Yes. Mr. Polino? Yes. Mrs. McAvoy? Yes. Next, we're going on to curriculum related items, numbers 14 to 19. I'll move it. <clears throat> Second. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Mrs. Claus? Yes. Mr. Scanlon? Yes. Mr. Peters? Yes. Mrs. DeSenza? Yes. Mrs. Downing? Yes. Mr. Polino? Yes. Mrs. McAvoy? Yes. Next, we have items 20 to 21, and they are the ARP IDEA grant and the grant funded salaries. Can we have a motion, please? I'll move motion, it. Peters. Okay, Second. Ms. Mrs. Mr. Peters and Mrs. Downing, thank you. Um, any discussion? Any discussion, please. I, I have a question. So, okay. um, these are all obviously it says salary uh, charged to grant. So, um, what happens if we don't get this grant next year, or what do we do with the the people right. that we're employing? Right. Two two ways I'll answer that. Okay. For the um, ESEA, the old NCLB grant. Uh, <laughs> There's no real foreseeable end to that grant. So those positions are sustainable from year to year. Okay. The positions that are funded by uh, the one-time 
ESSER money or the ARP IDEA money, uh, any of those other grants, those are only for the period of the grant. And then the positions, uh, because they are necessitated because of the pandemic and funded with pandemic money, will go away when the money goes away. Okay, so the, that's the ESSER two grant that you're talking about then. Yes, Those positions will go away. And these people yes. then are not employed already with us or did they just move positions so we're paying them for that? Or is... I think it's a combination. I, I don't okay. know off the top of my head, uh, but uh, I think it's mostly new folks who didn't okay. have anything else going on. Okay, all right, thank you. Sure. Okay, roll call please. Mrs. Claus. Yes. Mr. Scanlon. Yes. Mr. Peters. Yes. Mrs. DeSenza. Yes. Mrs. Downing. Yes. yes. Mr. Polino. Yes. Mrs. McAvoy. Yes. Let's go on the items number 22 to 24, student transportation and out of district placement. Motion, please. Make that motion. Second. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Mrs. Claus. Yes. Mr. Scanlon. Yes. Mr. Peters. Yes. Mrs. DeSenza. Yes. Mrs. Downing. Yes. Mr. Polino. Yes. Mrs. McAvoy. Yes. Items 25 and 26, the first read of policy and the second read of policies and regulations. Motion? Motion, Peters. Well, second. Any discussion? Roll call. Mrs. Claus. Yes. Mr. Scanlon. Yes. Mr. Peters. Yes. Mrs. DeSenza. Yes on 25, abstain on 26. I wasn't present for the discussion. Thank you. Mrs. Downing. Yes. Mr. Polino. Yes. Mrs. McElroy. Yes. Moving on to numbers 27 to 30, the Ocean County College Satellite Campus Elementary Bus Handbook, Curriculum Approval, and the HIBS. Motion, please. Motion. I'll second. Down. Any discussion? Roll call. Mrs. Claus. Yes. Mr. Scanlon. Yes. Mr. Peters. Yes. Mrs. DeSenza. Yes. Mrs. Downing. Yes. Mr. Polino. Yes. Mrs. McAvoy. Yes. Moving on to donations, letter B. And on behalf of the entire board, we would like to thank the community for all the donations. We love donations. Thank you. And we have a motion to approve the donations. Move. No second. Second. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Mrs. Claus. Yes, and thank you. Mr. Scanlon. Yes, and thank you. Mr. Peters. Yes, and thank you so much. This is the sense of. Yes, and thank you. It was $4,175 worth of goods and services. Thank you so much. Mrs. Downing. Thank you, yes. Mr. Polino. Thank you. Yes. Mrs. McAvoy. Yes. Moving on to letter C. Letter Programs and curriculum. Motion, please. Motion, Polino. Second, DeSenza. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Mrs. Claus. Yes. Mr. Scanlon. Yes. Mr. Peters. Yes. Mrs. DeSenza. Yes. Mrs. Downing. Yes. Mr. Polino. Yes. Mrs. McAvoy. Yes. Letter D, professional days and workshops. Motion? Motion, I'll do it. I'll second it. Any discussion? I have a question. I noticed that three of these are virtual um, workshops and there's one that is not. And it's, I believe, out of state. Um, this, is, this is time off from school as well, correct? Dr. Clark? Sorry, you're muted. Yes, that is correct. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you. Roll call, please. Mrs. Claus? Yes. Mr. Scanlon? Yes. Mr. Peters? No, I don't think we should have people traveling out of state. I'm sorry. Mrs. DeSenza? 
Yes. This is Downey. I'm gonna vote yes on the virtual, but I agree with Mr. Peters about going out of state. I'm gonna vote no on that one, but yes on the others. Okay. Mr. Polino. I too agree with uh, Ms. Downing and uh, Mr. Peter. So yes on the virtual and no to out of state. Ms. McAvoy. Yes. Next we'll go on to letter E, certificated personnel numbers one to 10. Motion please. Motion, Motion please. Second. Any was discussion? Is that Mrs. Downing second? Yes. Yes, yes. it was. Thank you. Okay, roll call, please. Mrs. Claus. Yes. Mr. Scanlon. Yes. Mr. Peters. Yes, and congratulations, Mrs. Bullock. You're a great asset to the district. Enjoy your retirement. Mrs. Desenso. Yes, and congratulations also to Mrs. Bullock. You'll be very missed. Mrs. Downing. Yes, and I ditto on uh, Mrs. Bullock. It's going to be funny, a little strange not to have her there. And then also our new replacement positions. I want to congratulate both of them and welcome aboard. Mr. Polino. Yes. Yes. And same thing, Mrs. Bullock, you've been an asset. You've had all my children. Congratulations on your retirement, very deserving. And Don Littner, Congratulations for becoming a new assistant principal at the high school. We're looking forward to working with you and seeing all the great things that you'll do. Congratulations. And that would be a yes. And I also want to make note that the substitute pay for teachers has increased from $90 a day to $105 a day. And the bus driver, the substitute bus driver, has just increased from 17 to $20. So I'm a yes. Thank you. Okay, next, letter F, non-certificated personnel. Motion. Second. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Mrs. Claus. Uh, I'm a yes. Uh, but I am voting no on the educational facilities manager. Mr. Scanlon. Uh, yes. Mr. Peters. Yes. Mrs. Senso. Yes, and that resignation with regret. Mrs. Downing. Yes, uh, I agree with Mrs. Uh, Desenza with regrets. Mr. Polino. Ditto, yes. Mrs. McAvoy. Yes. Mr. DeGeorge, at this time, are there any walk-on resolutions? No, ma'am. That's all we okay. have. Okay. Can we have a motion to adjourn the meeting, please? Move. Move. Motion. Move. All in favor? Aye. 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 Good night, have a good everybody. night, everyone. Thank you for Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night, John Boy. Good night, Mary Ellen. <laughs>